greet our brethren who are with us in live stream. We're glad you're with us this morning. Um, I wanted to uh, declare something about Jesus as the Son of God. I've been thinking about this a lot. It's been, a, it's been marvelous to look. It's, it, is a, it is a great blessing to look to Jesus. Amen. Great blessing. And one of the peculiarities of Jesus as the Son of God is that the church has been given to him as an everlasting possession by the Father. Peculiar not being odd or strange, but something that is unique to Jesus that isn't true of anybody else. The church hasn't been given to men. It's been given to Jesus. As the Son of God, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Well, there's a reason for a great thanksgiving, because that's where you were when he found you. You were among the heathen, and he, he, he brought you out from among every kindred, nation, tongue, and tribe in order to make a people for himself, because God has given him the church. Now, there's this in Hebrews chapter 3. I've been thinking on this for a couple of weeks. There's a marvelous comparison that's made between Moses and Christ. Both were faithful in all God's house. But this contrast is made in verse 5 and 6 that Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, yeah. whose house we are. See, so Moses, Moses served in the interests of God. See, the church that was in the wilderness didn't belong to Moses. Moses knew that. And so he served in the wilderness in the interests of God. But now Jesus serves not only in the interests of the Father, but also he serves in the prospect of the church being his. See, he's a son over his own house. We are servants in this respect. Okay? He is the son in this respect. In regard to the church's possession, this word was given by Jesus. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Well, that's our status right now. With regard to the church, when we minister to the church, we do it in the interest of another man. Because it really belongs to him. It doesn't belong to us. We're part of the church, but the church does not belong to us. It belongs to the Son. On one occasion, John the Baptist, remember his disciples came to him because they didn't understand why Jesus was baptizing more than he was baptizing. It seemed that there was like a shift in focus toward the Son, toward the end of John the Baptist's ministry. And they didn't understand this. But here was John's word about that. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. See, now, if you, if you came to a wedding and, and the bride, that, that, that processional music takes place and the bride comes down the aisle and, and all of a sudden, the best man kind of steps in front of the bridegroom and, and seeks to take the wife for himself. And this, this would be a strange thing, and that's what John is saying here. This is a strange thing that you're asking this. I'm serving as a servant. He serves as a son. It's right that he should take the bride unto himself. It's his. That's what he was saying. Amen. See? Now, Jesus died in the prospect of receiving the church unto himself. You remember these instructions that were given uh, under that old covenant era that you could take a Hebrew slave unto yourself. He would serve you for six years, and then in the seventh year, he would go out free. See? And the instructions went on to say that if he came in with a wife and children, then he would go out with a wife and children. But if he came in by himself, the master gives him a wife, and he has children while under the service of the master. And the seventh year, when he goes out, he goes out by himself. Unless, remember, unless, and this marvelous provision was made, if he should make this confession, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master 
shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, unto the doorpost, and his master, not the judges, his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. See, so there it is, way back there. Before Christ ever died, you are, you are being given the kind of mindset that Jesus had when he came to the cross to be pierced. Remember, notice first off, he said, I love my master. When I say what I'm saying today, I'm not saying that he's not serving the Father preeminently. He is serving him preeminently. But he's also serving in the prospect of, I love my wife. I love my wife. See? This is a marvelous truth to see. You might say that it's true of Jesus as it was of Jacob. It says of Jacob concerning Rachel, Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days for the love that he had to her. So he served in the prospect of her becoming his wife after seven years. That's what Jesus is doing. The church belongs to Jesus. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it unto himself, a glorious church, having neither spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it's that it should be holy and without blemish. See, so he died so that he might ultimately present her unto himself. See? Amen. Now, having said this, you understand that I'm not saying God gave it to Jesus and now it's not the church of God because that is the preeminent actual, that is the preeminent title of the church is that it's the church of God. So it's not that it's not the church of God, but it is also the church of Jesus Christ. It is that. Thine are mine, and mine are thine. See? That's how it is. Now, the knowledge of this truth actually makes for zealous laborers. When you can see this as a believer, when you can see this, yeah. that the church has been given to Jesus, and you can associate that with the kind of investments that Jesus has made in the church. See, Jesus has an invested interest in the church. He has sacrificed to receive her to himself. Then it makes for zealous laborers. Scripture says he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Now this is, brethren, this is the sense in which the love of Christ constraineth us. He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, if you are sensitive to Christ, you are not willing for Jesus to pay such an enormous price to have a particular objective in mind and then for him not to realize that objective. If he died to purify us unto himself and to have a zealous people, then I'm going to stay pure and I'm going to be zealous. Amen. See? Another thing you want to see here, here is that this, this truth of the church being Christ's possession makes for great confidence before the living God. It does. You must learn to associate your preservation with belonging to Christ as his peculiar possession. Amen. You, can look at it, you can look at it like, well, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing so much for him and now he's preserving me. But now let's get up on a higher, well, let's get up on a higher level. There's a higher level than that. Here's what Jesus said. I will build my church, my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now you, brethren, you take care of what is precious to you, don't you? It's yours. You don't just entrust it to anybody. You take careful care of it. How much more does the Son of God take care of what's his possession, especially when he died to receive it to himself? See, it's my church. And the gates of hell, by the way, he's not preserving any other kind of church. <laughs> no, he's, he, he's preserving his own. He's preserving his own. He said this to the Father, Those that thou hast given me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition. See, that's how you want to see him. If you've been preserved to date, and you have, because I know of your faith, this is how you got to reason. You've been preserved because you were given to Jesus. And Jesus keeps what the Father gives to him. Amen. What a, oh, that's, that, that, that's a reason for great confidence, brother. Yeah. Now, what does this have to do with us today? What does this have to do with our meeting? Your conduct among the brethren will be determined by your understanding of this truth. 
Okay, let me say that a different way. Your conduct will be productive and helpful in the assembly, in the various ministries that we have, as you can preeminently see the people of God as belonging to Jesus and secondarily having association with you. Mm -hmm. Much of the stumbling that has taken place, and brethren, this is the sense in which John said that he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. When he's in the light, this is what he sees. Mm -hmm. The church belongs to Jesus. And so I'm not willing to put a stumbling block between, between Somebody that belongs to Jesus. I'm not willing to do that. This is the sense in which that is the case. Here's something that was said of, to Timothy. Paul gave this commendation, and you want to see if someone godly can give this kind of commendation of you, brethren. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I may be of good comfort when I know your state, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. You want to know why Timothy took such a natural care to the church? Because when he looked at the church, he saw it as something that belongs to Jesus Christ. That's why he did that. See, and, and when you can see it that way, when you can see the church that way, you will have the same zealous care. Because I know of your love for Jesus. And this will stir up your care for the people when you can see them after that, after that right. Here's a word that was given to the Ephesian elders. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, mm -hmm. the flock, over which the Holy, Spirit, Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And so that's what we want to do this morning. We want, when we look to one another, we see we've had this word in recent weeks about not knowing one another after flesh. This is the antithesis, antithesis of knowing one another after the flesh is seeing one another preeminently with, with a regard to our association with Jesus Christ. We belong to him. He died for us. He is ultimately going to receive us unto himself. You want to have the same kind of heart that Paul had when he, when he looked at the Corinthians and was troubled and said... I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. See? And so as we give ourselves to, to doing that today, we'll be edifiers one to another, and there will be none occasion of stumbling among us. Father, we are thankful for this marvelous truth. We know that, Father, the church belongs to the Son of God, and we are glad that it is this way, Father. Help us to not know one another after the flesh, but to see this marvelous truth. And in this day... May everything we do preeminently be pleasing in your sight and then honoring to the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. May all things be done unto edification, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.